everybody to the Yesmaro Summer Lecture Series. Um, my name is Kate Stevenson. I'm the director here at Yesmaro, and we're always excited to offer these these lectures in the summer to the public and the local community. Uh, this is the last lecture of our our ten lecture series, and we are excited to have Don to talk with to talk with us about the state of architecture in Vermont and um, do something. I, I don't know that we've ever had like a architecture critic here as part of the series. So if this is interesting to just hear about kind of what's happening in the state, some some opinions, and um, I'll let you kind of say a little bit more about your background and introduce yourself. Great. Thank you, Kate. And I just found out that you aren't required to be here. And so I'm very grateful to all of you for uh, bothering to uh, show up for this event. Um, I want to uh, apologize for putting the wrong date on my slide. Uh, if you want to think that you're going an advanced look at something, it will actually go official tomorrow. That would be great. And uh, I, you know, I was thinking about um, the title that I gave this lecture, uh, Round Bar and Square Clients and the State of Architecture in Vermont. I, uh, I wrote that title without realizing that I was really paying homage to uh, a favorite book of mine about architecture, which is called Round Buildings, Square Buildings, and Buildings That Wiggle Like a Fish, which was written by, it's a, it's a book for children about architecture that was written by an attorney over in Maine, where I used to live, named Phil Iverson. And uh, I'm an attorney who, uh, like Phil, who is sort of a, uh, not really a mentor, but a inspiration to me, uh, I'm a lawyer who, and here I'm just going to launch into my disclaimers, uh, who is absolutely devoid of qualifications to opine about architecture, other than the fact that I'm 55 years old and have spent most of my life either in or near buildings. So that's my first disclaimer. I have no, unlike many of you, I have no academic training in this subject. I have no practical experience. I've never designed a building. Uh, but I care about buildings a lot because I grew up in the New York area and I used to go visit my grandparents as a kid. My first architectural memory is the destruction of Penn Station in New York. I thought it was really cool because I saw the supplement in the New York Times all about this really exciting multi-leveled complex that they were going to build in, in, uh, in, uh, instead of that old, decrepit, crumbling Penn Station. And I've been sort of atoning for my youthful indiscretion of being excited about that change uh, ever since. Uh, I consider myself an architectural provocateur. This is my next disclaimer. Uh, my purpose is to just get, is simply to get people to notice the built world around them uh, and figure out, think about whether any particular building they're either in or near is either oppressing them or uh, supporting them. So, and as a provocateur, I'm not pretending to present you with anything comprehensive or intellectually rigorous. Uh, what you're really going to see are my somewhat random impressions and musings. Uh, you, every one of you, if you spend any significant time in Vermont, uh, in Vermont, could easily do exactly what I'm about to do. Uh, and uh, my next disclaimer is that there will not be, uh, as far as I know, a single word here about Burlington our largest city. Uh, and I, I, you know, that's really for two reasons. One, I personally happen not to live anywhere near Burlington, and so it's not on my general trajectory as a person. And two, I, I, I just don't really think of Burlington as the real Vermont. Uh, and so you'll just have to live with that. Uh, my personal focus is on contemporary architecture. Uh, but I would contend that this is evidence of my deep and abiding respect for principles of historicism. Why? Because I am interested in creating things that our descendants will want to landmark tomorrow. If all we do is worry about what we can landmark today from the 19th and 18th centuries, then we won't create any landmarks. We need to create, we need to create landmarks. And my last disclaimer is that uh, I did mention that I'm a lawyer. I have a day job that is not at all connected to any of this. If you have any notion of what my day job is, please be assured that I am not authorized to speak on behalf of my employer or any other institution with which I might be affiliated. And I'm saying that not just for the benefit of the folks here, but also anybody who might be watching this or listening to this on some subsequent occasion. It's very important to me. So now I want to know who we have here. Uh, how many of you folks actually live here in Vermont? 
And how many of you are from away? Away from Vermont. So it's about half and half. So some of you will be learning a little bit about Vermont, and some of you hopefully will be seeing some stuff that you uh, are familiar with. And uh, how many here are people who are in the uh, design professions, either as architects or builders or design builders? or So lots of people in the room who know more than I do about the subject I'm going to be talking about. That's good. And uh, how many people here are journalists who are scribbling down everything I write in hopes of uh, reporting it in the, uh, on VT Digger tomorrow morning? Nobody. That's really good. OK. So here's what we're going to do tonight. This is a preview of the lecture. Uh, I'm going to tell you about three Vermont architectural firms that the savvy among you will have already heard of, but that some of you might not already know about. I'm going to talk about four Vermont educational institutions. Uh, they are, I'll tell you which ones they are, Middlebury College, Bennington College, the Putney School, and uh, Vermont Law School. Uh, they are all important commissioners of Vermont architecture, but not everything they do is successful, and we can think about why that is. And I am, because I'm a lawyer, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the law. Uh, not because I care about the law, but because I think it's at the heart of one design issue that continues to uh, roil through Vermont. So, here is a pair of arches that I see every day when I go to work. And to me, they typify exactly what is wrong with Vermont architecture today. And my question is, how did we get to the point where people, sane, sensible, uh, responsible people, you know, build stuff like that here in Vermont? How did we get here? Well, here's how. It started with uh, this building, which is the headquarters of the Vermont Agency of Agriculture. It uh, is a really cool Richardsonian building that was built in 1891 as the headquarters of the National Life Insurance Company. And it was designed by an architect uh, from Boston named S. Edwin Toby. So uh, eventually it became necessary. This is right on State Street, right across from the State House in Montpelier. Eventually it became necessary to build right next door to the Vermont Agency of Agriculture building. And of course, things being what they are, uh, it became necessary to harmonize and contextualize. So here is what we created. Uh, this is a building that was built in the 1990s. And it houses on the first floor a bank, and on the top three floors a, a pair of state agencies. Well, so how do you accommodate this, this really beautiful, dignified, 19th, uh, you know, early 20th century building with uh, this need to sort of create something on the cheap right next door that would harmonize. Well, unfortunately, banks need drive-ins, and so you eventually had to build this goofy set of arches so that, you know, the cars could drive into the bottom of the bank, and yet you still needed these arches on the first floor to sort of uh, imitate, I guess, the arches of the Richardsonian buildings next door. H.H. H. Richardson is probably rolling under, over in his grave uh, about this, and now I've just violated my promise not to mention Burlington, since uh, some of you might know that the Billings uh, Library in, at UVM in Burlington is a Richardson building that is finally being repurposed by UVM, which means that there is hope for our friends at the University of Vermont. So <laughs> we're stuck in nostalgia, basically, and more precisely, our lack of faith in an ability to do anything new. So my question becomes, how did we get from something like this, a, uh, this is not a particularly great example of a New England connected farmhouse, but it just happens to be one I drove by the other day, and I took a picture of it, and it has a lot of integrity, I would say, to it. How did we get from building something like this as a place to live to something like this? This is a, a house that I came across uh, when I was in uh, Bennington a few months ago, and uh, I would say that, first of all, I, I, I'm not trying to trash people for their architectural choices. And in particular, I don't want to trash people for not being ultra wealthy enough to hire one of the fabulous architects I'm about to talk about to design a home for them. But these folks clearly had the means and the interest to do something to their house, right? They applied some decorative elements to it. And they, you know, the house is in good order. So these are people who cared about what their house looks like, and yet they built something like this. Why do they do that? Why do people do that? I would say it's a function of visual and aesthetic illiteracy. 
a lack of imagination and the fact that a, the growing disparities in wealth is causing people in Vermont, as elsewhere, to lose faith in the commons and circle their wagons a little bit and design homes for themselves that are very uh, ungenerous in their outlook on the world around them. So, and you know, I think this sort of bland, sort of uh, windowless, nearly windowless face that these folks have created here really speaks to a certain, uh, certain inward focus that I find troubling. However, there are signs of hope. This, anybody know what this building is? This building won a big uh, AA Vermont award this year, and it is the expansion and renovation of the King Arthur Flower retail store on Route 5 in Norwich. It was designed by uh, the Truex Cullens firm uh, over in Burlington, and it, it uh, won an award this year. I'm very excited about this project. And the reason I'm excited about this project is I used to live in Maine, and I'm familiar with what L.L. Bean did to Freeport, Maine. And if you know anything about King Arthur Flower, King Arthur Flower is to our part of Vermont in the Connecticut Valley, especially in Norwich, as uh, L.L. Bean is to Freeport. And yet rather than choose to uh, sort of reconfigure Norwich to turn it into a theme park for uh, people who like uh, fancy flowers and baking implements, uh, the folks at... Uh, King Arthur Flower chose to do something really different and so they created this cozy little compound uh, and they put the parking lot uh, off in a hidden little glen far from the street and, uh, and really created I think what looks to me like a pleasant homage to, uh, uh, to um, the monitor barn aesthetic that we like in Vermont, but also the uh, post and beam style without really uh, making something that looks like it's like the building I showed you at the beginning that's just imitating things that people did before. Uh, to what do you attribute this kind of enlightenment? Well, my theory is that King Arthur Flower is an employee-owned company and so is very public spirited, very committed to making a building for itself that neither oppresses its employees, nor its customers, nor the community around it. Um, okay, this brings me around to one of the, the first of the three architecture firms that I wanted to talk about. This firm, this is the Hunger Mountain Food Co-op in Montpelier, has anybody ever been there? So the Hunger Mountain Food Co-op, I think, is the best retail project in Vermont. It's on the Winooski River in Montpelier. Uh, it was designed by the Gossens Bachman architecture firm in uh, Montpelier. And uh, there, and, and I should say, by the way, that really this is, at this point, this project has become a collaborative effort because essentially this part of it was the original Gossens Bachman part of the project. And then this part was done by the McClay, McClay firm, which is right here in Greater Metropolitan uh, Waitsfield. And I think altogether this is the uh, best retail project in Vermont. It's an homage to the granite sheds in whose historic district the building was placed. Uh, and it is a distinctively Vermont take on the sort of big box. If you go into the building, you see that it's a very uh, unusual take on traditional supermarket design that eschews the uh, sort of old-fashioned uh, linear aisles in favor of a much more uh, interactive design for choosing food. And, uh, and it's been a great success. It really has, um, it has this really nice corrugated surface that uh, isn't imitating anything. Uh, and then while McClay f uh, got the uh, commission to um, expand the food co-op in Montpelier, the Gossens Bachman folks were designing this really cool building in Brattleboro, which is the new Brattleboro food co-op building. Uh, it's a really exciting building because it's mixed use. Uh, if you've ever been to Brattleboro, you might remember that the food co-op was in this schlocky old shopping plaza that had a big parking lot in front of it. 
what the uh, Gossens Bachman design does is it moves the building out to the uh, street line so that now we have a building that actually anchors downtown Brattleboro. It's mixed use, so you have low income housing up in the upper floors of the building and you have a revitalized, totally contemporary food retailing uh, extravaganza and the nice people at Gossens Bachman were able to shepherd the Brattleboro Food Co-op through their construction project even though the uh, construction firm that they had hired as their prime contractor went bankrupt while the building was nearing completion. So there you go. So it's not a coincidence that these two excellent retail projects are consumer owned. The supermarket chains, I am telling you, are not building like this except for maybe Whole Foods uh, and I'm not going to talk about Whole Foods. Okay. The next architecture firm I want to tell you about is called Watershed Studio. It's in White River Junction. It was founded by Daniel Johnson. I know he's a fellow who has taught here at um, the Estomaro School from time to time. I think Daniel is doing some of the best work in Vermont. Uh, this is uh, a really nice uh, lakeside cottage of the type that obviously isn't imitating anything, uh, and yet it's providing the kind of uh, exciting vacation -y experience on a modest, modest budget that I think Vermonters and uh, New Hampshireans really need for their uh, vacation homes. And this is what that same project, I apologize for the bad photography, I stole this photograph from somebody. Uh, and you can see it's just a really, you know, nice um, intimate exchange with its environment. And then we have this hacienda of a building that Watershed did. Uh, I think it has, uh, it really reminds me of something you'd see at a ranch out in the west somewhere, and yet it seems to work really nicely here in Vermont as a house that has a lot of outdoor spaces and indoor spaces and accommodates, I happen to know the owners of this house, and they're a uh, very unusual couple with diverse tastes, and this house is enough, uh, is diverse and big enough to give both husband and wife all of what they want without bankrupting them. That's pretty exciting. And then this is uh, Watershed Studios modular house uh, in Hartford. And uh, I actually don't know a lot about this project because Daniel sent me this sli these slides about five minutes before I left to go here. But that's the best of what they do. And uh, finally, the third architecture firm that I wanted to talk to you about that you may not have heard about here in Vermont is called LineSync. And LineSync is a firm that's located in Wilmington down on Route 9 in the very bottomest bottom part of Vermont, Massachusetts. It was founded by Julie Leinberger and Joseph Sincata. They're so far away from the center that they don't get enough attention, even though they win awards all the time. And they did ask me to credit their photos to the fabulous photographers of uh, uh, Carolyn Bates and Gary Hall. This project was intended to create edgy design in a grandfathered footprint of less than 1,000 feet on Lake Bomacine, which is uh, not a fancy lake like the lakes you have in New Hampshire, a modest lake. So you can see that from my standpoint as an architecture critic, what I really respect about uh, ar Vermont architecture are people who are trying to uh, provide uh, sort of quintessential Vermont vacation-y architectural experiences for people uh, without being garish or ostentatious, uh, resonating with the uh, lakeside environment, and yet still doing things that are sort of innovative and provide a touch of luxury and whimsy to them. Uh, the motto of the LineSync firm is art in everyday life. And to me, you know, that says it all. The idea of getting people to notice on an everyday basis what it is that's either delighting them or oppressing them. Oops, clicked ahead a little too far. Uh, this is another LineSync project called the uh, Sonax Corporation, which is in uh, Bellows Falls, Vermont. And I stumbled across this when I was driving up Route 5 in Bellows Falls, and uh, it's very unusual. In fact, I can't think of any other examples of this, uh, well, maybe one or two, where a company that has uh, an industrial process that it's trying to accomplish actually bothers to commission something <laughs> of any architectural distinction or unusualness. Uh, 
This company is not sexy. Here's what, they, here's what Sonex says about itself. Sonex is a diversified supplier of specialized drivetrain drive products to the automotive and commercial vehicle industries and to industrial sectors utilizing drivetrain drive train technology. We design, manufacture, test, and distribute a wide variety of components used to remanufacture torque converters to rebuild automatic transmissions and to protect drive shafts and associated components for over torque damage. So basically, this is a firm that is building uh, aftermarket components for uh, vehicles, and yet somehow they managed to commission this really cool looking uh, headquarters for, their, uh, for what they actually do. This is actually a fairly old building now. It was completed in 1996. Uh, at the time it was built, it featured the largest use of stay-in-place concrete wall forms in North America. And uh, at the time of its construction, the system netted a $20,000 per year savings in energy costs over uh, what they would have been able to achieve by building a plain old conventional metal building and uh, putting lots of insulation in it. Altogether, I would say, this project offers a hopeful reprise of the uh, precision industries that brought prosperity to Wyndham and Windsor counties down in the Connecticut River a century ago. And no surprise, this company, like the, some of the other projects that I've shown you, is an employee-owned company. And apropos of absolutely nothing, if you happen to drive up Route 5 and stumble across the Sonex factory, you really should backtrack into Bellows Falls. This will prove that I'm not completely hostile to historic architecture. And check out Bellows Falls' Spanish Colonial Revival Post Office. Because it's just one of these delightful things about Vermont that for no reason that anybody has ever been able to explain to my satisfaction, this Spanish Colonial Revival Post Office was built in Bellows Falls, Vermont. Uh, during, the, uh, during the New Deal era when they were building a lot of post offices. It has apparently a companion post office built to exactly the same design in the town of Mejia, Texas. <laughs> well, check out their post office. You should, in fact, I'd love to have a picture of their post office. Now, I can see that art in everyday life is a great motto, but it's not going to drive Vermont forward architecturally without help from institutions that have the money and the mission to build significant buildings. And I have four examples of how such institutions are doing. There is good news and there's bad news. Let's start with the bad news. <laughs> this, at the time of its construction, uh, about a decade ago, I think now, was the biggest building in Vermont. I'm not sure if it still is or whether uh, the folks up at Fletcher Allen, one of their new buildings, is bigger than this one. Uh, but it was the biggest building in its day, and it was built by what I believe to be the richest institution in Vermont. Happens to be, anybody know? Yeah. Right, my alma mater, Middlebury College. Now, back in my student days at Middlebury during the Hoover administration, among the visual delights of approaching Middlebury College, uh, was arriving on campus from the west along Route 125 from Cornwall. You'd come up over a hill, and there ahead of you, you would see this really cool Vermont skyline of sorts. It was a series of very modestly scaled buildings along a ridge, and you know, sort of hovering above the rolling farm fields below. Most of these buildings were a series of very pleasant dorms that were designed by Freeman French Freeman back in the 1960s as a kind of uh, Vermont humane reinterpretation of uh, Paul Rudolph-style brutalism. Now those buildings, I lived in one of those buildings, so don't make fun of them. They've been decimated since then, regrettably, and coated with a theme park uh, sort of veneer. And more importantly, the modest skyline that you used to see when you came up from Route 125 has been replaced in part by this looming hulk designed by a firm over in New York called Payette Associates. And I, to me, it just looks like a maximum security prison. I, if, you go, if, if you've been in the building, you know, it has uh, some interesting things going on inside of it. And it certainly houses the sciences at Middlebury in a, you know, I suppose a programmatically adequate way, but I, I just, I, I've never been able to ignore myself to how 
uh, Middlebury College managed to build this and, uh, and be proud of it. And sadly, the college did not stop here. Uh, as uh, those of you who have been to the college know, it has an iconic trio of buildings from the 18th century known as Old Stone Row. And in the 60s, uh, the college hired the Architects Collaborative Firm uh, to ruin the approach to Old Stone Row from downtown by constructing a big concrete warehouse of a building that was essentially right in front of those icons. And the only happy consequence of Bicentennial Hall was that they tore down that warehouse, which is where the sciences used to be, and restored the approach to Old Stone Row. So you could come up from downtown Middlebury and you would see this iconic trio of 19th century uh, gray buildings. But then a strange thing happened. The college held a competition to remodel and expand its main library. And they hired Guathme Siegel, a perfectly respectable, famous uh, architecture firm, based on that firm's proposal to do just that. I've seen the design. It looked nice. But then they turned around and told Guathme, much to his surprise, uh, to scrap their whole proposal and create a brand new library instead. And where did they put it? Right where the old science building was. So instead of reopening that vista, they closed it off again and put this dreary uh, sort of I don't know, just sort of hulk of a building right in front of the iconic buildings. This is the signature building of the college, Old Chapel. And you, know, you can decide for yourselves, you don't have to agree with me, whether this juxtaposition is the right way to uh, steward Middlebury College. Now in fairness, I have to say, the college eventually hired CBT Architects, another good firm from Boston, to transform the uh, Star Library into the Axon Center, which is, uh, I think, a fairly successful effort to provide a home for all of the humanities at the core of the liberal arts curriculum and put it all into one centralized and pretty high-tech spot at the heart of campus. Uh, and happily, although I don't have a picture of it, there was no attempt to desecrate the Beaux-Arts facade uh, of Star Library that faces Old Stone Row. Uh, and the additions which are in the back are understated, I think, and fairly dignified. Now, just as Middlebury College correctly did not repudiate its flirtation with Beaux-Arts design, so too, in my opinion, should it be proud of this. Uh, I, uh, this is the uh, Mahaney Center for the Arts at Middlebury College. It was completed in 1992 by the Hardy Holtzman and Pfeiffer firm. I might be the only person in all of Vermont who likes it. I think it's just a fabulous example, and I've deliberately given you a, a pretty ugly slide of sort of one elevation of the building. Uh, it's a fabulous example of uh, post-modernism. And if you go inside of it, you see it's such a really great, busy beaver of a place. It's full of fun and vitality. It's so lacking in the self-importance that suffuses most of the rest of campus, and really anything, I think, that rebels against the humor deficit disorder that's so rampant in our culture <laughs> and on a campus like Middlebury's is just, is just a great thing. And so if you have already decided you hate this building, I would urge you to go back to Middlebury College, maybe get a ticket for a performance at, you know, in one of the performance spaces in the building, and reconsider it. Because I get it that postmodernism was a brief, uh, sort of delusional period in our architectural history, but it was legitimate. It was a legitimate <coughs> flirtation, and we should embrace it and honor it and consider the uh, Mahaney Center at Middlebury College as really one of the best examples that you can find of that. I mean, Hardy Holtzman was, you know, as good as it gets in postmodernism, and we've got a great piece of it here in Vermont, so you should love it. Okay, enough about my <laughs> alma mater, now on to my favorite employer, or my former employer. Uh, Vermont Law School. Now this is the road not taken. Uh, this is the uh, Chase Community Center at Vermont Law School. It was originally built as the uh, library at the law school. And uh, Vermont Law School was founded in the 1970s at the height of the design build movement that exploded through the Mad River Valley and is the reason we're all here today at Yes Tomorrow. And so it isn't surprising that the original idea for the VLS campus was to build it out completely in the aesthetic of David Sellers and William Reinecke and Peter Gluck and all of the other folks that were really creating this very distinctive design build aesthetic that I know you all know about because you've read the little book about it that I saw for sale when I walked in here tonight. Uh, this was the VLS library until the school trashed its original campus plan and went with something far more 
cautious and prosaic. And I, I just uh, really would ask you to think for a minute about what it would have been like if a whole school had been, I wish I had a, I wish I could bring the model, I've seen it. There was a whole campus plan that was built around making Vermont Law School look like this. You know, imagine what that would have been like. Uh, instead, here's what Vermont Law School has been doing. This is uh, the main corner in South Royalton, Vermont. And the building you're looking at what used to be called Freck's Department, uh, Department Store it is now the Center for Legal Services at Vermont Law School. And it houses all of the clinical programs at Vermont Law School. And the renovation of the building was designed by Truex Collins. And I watched them build this thing. I have dozens of pictures of them constructing this. They tore down all of Freck's Department Store except for the facade of the building that they propped up like a Potemkin village for a few months. And the uh, building is clad in this pressed tin that they replaced. And the whole idea was to create or preserve the, quote, historic, unquote, facade of Freck's department store. To me, it's historicism and historic preservation run riot. I mean, the idea that everything is, uh, that's old needs to be preserved just didn't, doesn't make any sense to me, particularly when so little of the original building is really there. I mean, the, even the pressed tin got replaced. And so what you have here is, I think, a, you know, a pretty boring building that is a missed opportunity to reinvent a thriving downtown for South Royalton by bringing the law school right up to the edge of the downtown in a way that would have said something about the 21st century instead of the 20th or the 19th century. And then this is the back end of that same building. And you see that what you ended up getting here is, um, I don't know, I mean, it's, it's not ugly exactly, but neither is it particularly inspiring with respect to the face that it presents to the uh, rest of the Vermont Law School campus. So I think it's a missed opportunity, and I think we need to rethink reflexive historicism. Okay. Anybody recognize this building? Barnes. Say what? The Barnes. The Barnes, right, which is in? Okay, and for five points, why is there a picture of a building from Philadelphia in a lecture about contemporary Vermont architecture? That's right, exactly, exactly. This is a fabulous building that was created in Philadelphia. I, I gave a whole lecture at Vermont Law School uh, about the uh, Barnes Foundation and the sort of legal <laughs> dispute that led to the creation of this really cool <coughs> building in Philadelphia. It was designed by Todd Williams and Billy Chen, who are, I think, the best architects practicing anywhere in the United States these days. And happily, we have an example of their work recently completed here in Vermont at Bennington College, which spent the princely sum of 14 million bucks creating the Center for the Advancement of Public Action, or CAPA. CAPA is really three buildings. It's a building that houses uh, conference and classroom spaces that I think are worthy of the United Nations. It has another building that's uh, three, I think, apartments for visiting scholars. And then a third building, which is the one you see on the left there, which is really a folly called the Lens. It really is. Um, this is what the inside of the lens looks like. It's really, I guess, a chapel and sort of meditation space uh, that has this oculus uh, inside of it. A very cool thing. No, it's very hard to photograph, though. So what do I like about the Center for Advancement of Public Action? Well, it's, uh, it's a building that you really want to rub. Uh, the building is clad in used pieces or discarded pieces of marble that the uh, builders found at various uh, marble quarries around the state. And so you can see, I, I don't have a good photograph of it, but a lot of these pieces of marble have uh, uh, evidence on them of having been um, extracted from the mines. You see marks that uh, the quarriers used. And uh, the uh, pieces are placed in a way that isn't flush at all. So it's the sort of building that you really want to literally walk up to and rub and check out each of the individual pieces. And that kind of uh, attention to texture and detail, very characteristic of Williams and Chen, if you know their work. Uh, if you notice, the building appears to be very horizontal with flat roofs, 
that's actually a uh, joke of sorts and that the roofs of this building are anything but flat. They, at least in two of the buildings, hide a compluvium or an oculus uh, so that the rain kind of flows into the center of the building. Uh, the building's organized around a uh, compluvium that admits light into the middle of the building. And this sense of horizontality communicates a kind of, uh, I would say, humility and connection to the earth that is really the opposite of some of the, uh, well, it's the opposite of what you saw in Bicentennial Hall, say, back over at Middlebury College. Uh, the form and the function of this building kind of created each other, uh, lubricated by a $20 million gift from an alumna of the college, uh, in the sense that the college had a, bill, a vision for wanting to read configure its curriculum so that people could become more engaged in empowering themselves. And so the center and the reimagining of the curriculum kind of happened in tandem, which made relations with the architecture firm fairly interesting. And uh, altogether, the project perpetuates the Bennington tradition of having a distinguished collection of architecture, uh, much like the folks at Wellesley College have done. And just to remind you, here's a few other little gems that you can visit if you uh, happen to head down to Bennington. This is the uh, dormitory, uh, three dormitories, actually, that Q Sun Wu designed at Bennington. And if you want to go back, if you're an, a sort of uh, international style 1970s architecture fan, these are Edward Larrabee Barnes dorms that were designed at Bennington that I think the college is in the process of trying to figure out what to do with, because uh, they've concluded that like much of the architecture that Mr. Barnes designed, it doesn't work as well as it was designed to, and so they're gonna rejigger them. Okay. The last stop on my institutional tour is the Putney School to show you my favorite building in all of Vermont, and I apologize if this slide is kind of dark. I'm really kind of a, not that great a photographer. Uh, this is the uh, Courier Center, which is the art building at the Putney School. Does everybody know what the Putney School is? Uh, it's a private secondary school, so unlike the other institutions I've shown you, it's not a college, it's just a high school, uh, fairly modest in scope. I don't think it's a particularly well-endowed institution. Uh, and, uh, and yet they managed to create this little bit of origami that alighted on a Vermont pasture. Uh, the thing that's distinctive about the Putney School is that it has a farm-based curriculum. So all the students uh, put in toil at a working farm that is uh, one of the dominant features of their campus. And the farm is this complex of red, traditional-looking, uh, old-fashioned Vermont farm buildings. And the historic headquarters of the school, where the, uh, most of the classroom teaching goes on, is an old-fashioned sort of white mansion-y looking building. And so you would have expected when the Putney School decided to build an art, art building uh, to create something that uh, looked like either the farm or the mansion. And instead they hired Charles Rose, the architect from Boston, to uh, create this really cool thing for them. Uh, and uh, this photograph really doesn't do the Courier Center justice, but it does show you how close they put this building to the sort of traditional white clabbered complex. This is connected to the main building of the school. And oh, way over here in the corner, you can see, just to give Bill McClay homage, this is the new uh, athletic complex that his firm designed over on the other end, sort of as the uh, counterpart to the Courier Center. Anyway. You see here that the building has this very uh, dynamic and flexible and friendly interior that I think is uh, really suitable for a high school art space. Uh, this is the dance studio, which I think is one of the coolest rooms I've seen. I really love the, the, uh, just the windows and the color scheme, the red and the green outside, really cool stuff. And I really think this is a building that dances its dance with the outdoors, too. And yes, the roof of this building leaks. And my response to that is, so what? It's a bit like having to maintain a non-indigenous plant. Uh, I think there's every reason to plant things like this in Vermont. And the Putney School is open, so you should go down to Putney and check it out. The school is located off in the forest somewhere. You can find it, but when you find it, you'll be able to walk into the building. They don't lock it during the day. You should check it out. Okay, now, 
none of this is what Vermonters are talking about when they're talking about architecture these days. Because when Vermonters are talking about architecture, they don't necessarily know that they're talking about architecture. What they're really busy arguing about are these things. Uh, these are uh, utility scale wind turbines. We have four utility scale wind projects here in Vermont that have been uh, built and uh, at least one or two more that are in the pipeline. Uh, the oldest one is in Searsburg, the Green Mountain Power Facility. It has 11 turbines, makes six megawatts of electricity. Those turbines are around 200 feet tall. Uh, this picture here is of the first wind project in Sheffield, up towards the Northeast Kingdom. That project has 16 turbines. It makes 40 megawatts of electricity and uh, these wind turbines are 418 feet tall. And I guess since you guys, most of you are design folks, I don't have to tell you how tall 418 feet really is. You can picture that in your mind's eye. Uh, recently completed the Kingdom Community Wind Project in Lowell. That has 21 turbines, makes 60 megawatts of electricity. Its turbines are 460 feet tall, very controversial. And then there is the project I happened to visit a few weeks ago, the Georgia Mountain Community Wind Project, it has only four turbines, so it makes just 10 megawatts of electricity, and those things are 430 feet tall, or actually 427 feet tall, and I got to stand right underneath them. And they are really big, and I think they're really graceful. In fact, I think that one day we'll look at these things and see them as compelling icons much as we look back today with nostalgia at lighthouses and silos, which are also industrial objects. But there's no doubt about the fact that they're big. They also make noise. Uh, and I, I, I don't mean to sweep that concern under the rug. My experience of the noise of this thing is that every time these big turbine blades uh, pass the tower, it would make a sort of a whoomp kind of a noise. But I, I, I didn't find it disturbing. On the other hand, I don't find the tick-tock of a clock disturbing during the daytime. If you put a clock in my bedroom while I'm trying to sleep, it becomes the most maddening experience I've ever had. But I, I still can't help but think that these big moving objects on the horizon are very compelling bits of uh, not just Vermont iconography, but also national iconography. I just flew out to Montana and back, and my daughter, of course, monopolized the window seat, so I didn't get to sightsee as much as I like to when I'm on an airplane. But every time I managed to muscle her out of the way and look out the window, I would look down and across the Great Plains, you see these things all over the place. The problem here in Vermont is that we build them on ridge lines because the optimal uh, conditions for generating wind power in Vermont are at elevations of between 2,000 and 2,500 feet. And that tends to be ridge lines, given the way our topography works. And so they become very visible uh, decorative additions to uh, what really formerly looked like pristine mountains. And so people are um, very concerned about them. How do we decide to build them? Well, Vermont is a state that actually purports to regulate aesthetics. And here is where I get to the law. Because really, the question is, by what legal principle, how should we decide whether to build something like this? And, well, here's how we regulate aesthetics in Vermont. <laughs> this is not a Vermont building. Anybody know where that building is? Texas. It's an airport hotel in uh, Houston, I think. So we regulate aesthetics in Vermont uh, pursuant to two statutes. Act 250 is the one you've probably heard of. It's the statute that governs major uh, developments in Vermont. And uh, related to Act 250 is another statute called Section 248. The standards are the same. Section 248 applies to uh, energy projects, and Act 250 applies to all other kinds of major development projects. And Act 250 and Section 248 have a list of, I think, nine distinct criteria that every development has to uh, uh, withstand scrutiny according to. And the aesthetic criterion is criterion number eight. Uh, and here is the determination that the administrative bureaucrats have to make in order to let you go forward with your project. The project must not have an undue adverse effect on the scenic or natural beauty of the area 
aesthetics, historic sites, or rare or irreplaceable natural areas. And so the Natural Resources Board in Vermont, which got the first crack at this, create, uh, had to decide a case called Queechee Lakes involving a big development plan down in Queechee. And they developed this test for determining whether something satisfied the aesthetic criterion. And it really is this two-part question. Will the project have an adverse effect? And if so, is the effect undue? Now, those of you who aren't lawyers, which I think is all of you, will think, well, duh, that's what the statute says, right? No undue adverse effect. But it's not a no-brainer, right? I mean, you have to think of a way to process this logically, right? You have to kind of get from A to B in a logical way. So the courts now have divided the relevant question into that two phases. And so this has implications, I think, for the way in which we're going to develop, develop Vermont. Now, here's how we look at the first question. The board looks to whether a proposed project will be in harmony with its surroundings. Does it fit in the context within which it will be located? Uh, what are the nature of the project's surroundings? Is the project compatible with those surroundings? Uh, the context, the colors, the materials, so the imperative here, and this is official public policy in Vermont, is all about har harmony. If it isn't harmonious, then it is considered adverse. But that's not the end of the story, because if something has an adverse effect, it still might be buildable as long as that effect is not undue. And here is how we decide whether something has an undue adverse effect. Does the, and if the answer to any of these questions is yes, the project is rejected and can't be built. Does it violate a clear written community standard? So communities essentially have the right, I think, to veto the new by promulgating a clear written community standard, meaning in their community, regional or local plan. Does the, this, is, this is the one that really bothers me. Does the project offend the sensibilities of the average person? Think back to the average person's house that I showed you at the beginning of this lecture, right? I mean, is that, are those the sensibilities that you want to be driving whether we get to build something like this or, for that matter, something like this, right? It's, it's, uh, it's worrisome. Is it offensive or shocking because it's out of character with its surroundings or significantly diminishes the scenic quality of the area? This notion of things being out of character with its surroundings is, uh, is I, I, I think it's troubling because I think we occasionally want things that are out of character with our surroundings, right? And has the applicant failed to take generally available mitigating steps which a reasonable person would take to improve the harmony of the project with its surroundings. Again, the emphasis on harmony, the idea that when we create something, when we create a work of architecture or design, we might need to mitigate its effects is it's, it's troubling to me. Public policy in Vermont fails to take into account the possibility that something could actually make the landscape more rather than less beautiful. That, I think, is the flaw in this public policy. And so ask yourself this question. Some, one of these things, this is, this is, remember I, the title of my lecture has to do with round barns. This is a Vermont round barn. It's one of those Vermont architectural forms that people revere in Vermont. We like these things. We preserve them. Would the first one of these, whichever one of these happened to be built first, would it have survived scrutiny under Act 250? And the answer is probably not. So what lessons? Well, we need to decondition Vermonters that architecture equals ugly and that architecture's effects have to be mitigated. We need to address wealth disparities and disempowerment because it turns out that the non-extractive businesses, the ones that are employee or community owned, are the ones that are building the great and life-affirming buildings. Uh, it turns out that clients matter more than architects. A great client can always hire uh, Todd Williams and a Billy Chen or a line sink firm or a watershed studio. Uh, architects and other design professionals need to be active public citizens. You people need to be on the boards and committees that are going to decide things like, does this have an adverse, undue adverse effect? Because if we leave that to other people, then the wrong decisions will be made. We need to be attentive, not just to the landmarks of yesterday, but to the landmarks of tomorrow. 
And if we do nothing, we will be awash in fake like this. This is a, a retaining wall that I watched get constructed. And I really liked the metal that actually does the work. And then when they put up this sort of faux masonry in front of it, I was just, I was just appalled. And, you know, we need to rebel against that. And finally, this is the last thing I want to say. We need to be alert to the beauty in the built world because really we can find it anywhere. You know, this is an ugly, as ugly a bit of concrete nowhereville. It's in Montreal under the interstate that cuts right to the heart of downtown. I just love that white line that I was able to discover when I was walking by. So that's what I want people to notice. And uh, so, and I've given you my email address and my telephone number if anybody wants to be in dialogue about anything I've said today. And with that, I guess I'm going to start stop talking and ask you if you have any questions. Mm -hmm. Wow, I did great. I talked for about as long as I'd hoped I would. Oh, you all look so great. <laughs> You became the sunset while I was talking, and so you became more and more <laughs> mysteriously uh, creatures of the shadows. I'm so taken with the round barn that we worship down that they were built because that was more industrially efficient. And we love our arches, but that's the way you put a keystone in, and that's the way you pile up stone if you want to make a, a transition. It wasn't done for any reason other than just practicality, but a thousand years later, now it's hard. Indeed, and, and you know, so much of what we build now is sort of off of those principles and is into just sort of pretend, pretense. Uh, I, mean, I, I didn't invent that idea. You know, Ada Louise Huxtable wrote a whole book about it that you can read. Um, I just, uh, you know, I'm preaching to, uh, to the converted here. I mean, the fact is that I should be going into my, uh, should be going into public libraries all over the state and asking people to uh, notice this stuff. Because I really think most people have managed to uh, condition themselves into obliviousness to what happens in the built world. And, you know, the thing is, you, I mean, I talk about how I don't have any qualifications to evaluate this stuff. And it's true uh, that I don't, and I've now proven that I don't. But the fact is that I, you really, everybody in Vermont appreciates the natural world and can talk about what about the natural world pleases them. And what I would say to them is you can apply the exact same criteria to the buildings you encounter. You know, the rules are the same, right? The laws of physics apply, uh, the uh, laws of the chemistry applies. Uh, you know, it's, it's the same. It's, really, it's just a continuum of what is beautiful and life affirming and what is stupid and if you know expedient. Don, what do you know about the process that the Putney School community went through to get the buy-in to create such an uncharacteristic building? Oh gosh, well you know the, support that. the Putney School is one of these uh, uh, schools that's it's a sm relatively small institution and uh, it's a residential school, so the students are living on campus. A lot of the faculty actually live on campus, too. And so it's a very intimate place. And so there were lots of, you know, on the continuum of, you know, do we just sort of, you know, task the vice president for uh, facilities with interfacing with the architecture firm and coming up with a design versus do we, are we totally collaborative? Do we have a gazillion meetings and charrettes and committees and all of that? You know, this was on that end of the scale where it was a very, uh, I happen to know this because I have a friend who was working at the Putney School at the time and it was very collaborative. And um, I think it's one of Charles Rose's best projects. He's done some good stuff. Uh, I don't think he has any other buildings in Vermont though. <coughs> I really appreciate your comment at the beginning about how we should be um, striving to make landmarks for the future. Um, as the best arc, uh, um, retail space in the entire state, do you feel that the uh, Hunger Mountain Co-op uh, stands up to that? Do you think that that's really a, a landmark for the future? 
Uh, you mean, do I think the Hunger Mountain Co-op will be wor- I think it's at least as worthy as Prex, Frex Department Store. Uh, will it well, be- you've told us that Frex Department Store is just a complete sham, so that, that's, no, that's nothing. <laughs> okay. Uh, I really want to give this a good... I, 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 the glib answer is, of course, yes, it's very... Uh, uh, but will it be worthy of preservation? I, I think it's too soon to tell. Maybe. I take it you don't like it. I, I just I'm curious oh. how that you know how that measures up to, uh, for example, the Department of Agriculture, which certainly is a, a landmark for the future. I I I really find the uh, Hunger Mountain Food Co-op to be a really one of the the neatest contemporary buildings in Montpelier, which has a few other buildings that I think are worthy yeah. of thought too. Uh, and so whether it will strike people that way a hundred years from now, I guess I'm, I'm an arrogant, opinionated guy, but I'm not that arrogant and opinionated. Mm-hmm. And so me. Also, uh, it, it also depends on what, how, how the building is uh, maintained and curated over the, uh, you know, how that, how that institution evolves. I mean, I was the president of my food co-op for three years. Uh, it happens to be the second biggest co-op, food co-op in the country. It's a $75 million dollar grocery empire. I've drunk the cooperative Kool-Aid. I actually think the cooperative business model is the one that has saved capitalism from itself. And so I think that if the program sticks with the building, you better believe it'll become a national monument because really, while everything else is in the toilet swirl, uh, you know, I think community-owned cooperative grocery stores are the future. And Vermont can be, this is not really getting off topic. Vermont <laughs> has a right to call itself the cooperative state because of the network of really excellent Food co-ops. I didn't mention the uh, food co-op in Burlington City Market, which is another architecturally interesting uh, uh, phenomenon in Burlington, and the one in Middlebury is quite beautiful. Uh, you know, I, I, I think this is. Uh, I'm ho- what I'm hoping will happen is that food co-ops will become as institutions historically significant mm-hmm. as Vermont evolves, and if that happens then I think definitely the Hunger Mountain Co-op will be, you know, a building with a big plaque in front of it 100 years from now. Also, um, I, I was very interested in your initial slide showing what was just completely obviously a bogus structural issue happening on the side of that building. And as something that you thought was perhaps not the best example of architecture in the state, and then you went on to show the CAPA building, which is equally, if not more, egregious in its egregious in its um, in its sort of structural bogosity as being one of the best. <laughs> so I was very interested to see that combination. You know, like thank you. Well, you know, complexity and contradiction, right? That's what it's all about. And if you like Robert Venturi, you got it. <laughs> Uh, well, so why do you think that the Kappa is bogus in the same well, way that those? I mean, it's, it, it obviously is. You've got these gigantic cantilevers over glass corners, which have no support. And obviously no, stru- no implied structure. True. But I would suggest that the, the intention there is slightly different than the intention of those goofy sort of faux arches, uh, you know, on State Street. He had a reason he had to get cars in there. These people did it just for effect, completely. Uh, exactly, that's, exactly. <laughs> You're right, though, I'm making excuses on the one hand and I'm condemning on the other, and uh, it's fair. Were you an architectural critic during the postmodern era? Uh, were, when were you interested in architecture at that point? Was like I in like early seventies when they were building that kind of stuff? You know, it's interesting because I did uh, sort of go on a hiatus for a while. I uh, I, didn't, I didn't go into my whole resume, but I was a journalist before I went to law school, and I used to write occasionally about architecture. But I worked for a newspaper that had a, a, a worked for an alternative newspaper in Maine, and there was another writer on the staff who fancied himself the art writer of the paper and for to his way of thinking that included architecture and so he didn't want me writing about architecture so I stopped doing it and it happened to coincide with the postmodern period and then I happened to get back into it for reasons it would be too long to explain uh, right after I got out of law school and really started uh, writing a lot about architecture as a way of keeping my journalism career active and that started in the 
mid to late 90s when postmodernism was had already run its course. So, so I was kind of out of the game during the height of the postmodernism modernism phase. And maybe I was lucky to be sort of. I uh, think however, so. It was a fairly repressive. Period. I'd be I'd be all disillusioned now if I'd been doing it. Well, that. I think that bank thing would have been taken fairly seriously. <laughs> And so what Jimmy's saying is right. There's really no distinction. Only the other thing was more of an emperor's new clothes kind of period in architecture. And I think the history books have sort of come up with that uh, impression. But I love the interior of that. Though. I think he's talking about the building at Middlebury, the blue one. Is that the one you're talking about? No. 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 Oh, the one with the, 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 the one with the marble going out over the you know, and there's a there's an expansion joint right at this. <laughs> no way. Yeah, to me it's fun. Yes, ma'am. Well, um, as an alumna of National Life, I was happy that you started out with the net, original National Life building. That's and not the original National Life building, though. That was actually the fourth headquarters of National Life. But that was, I think that was the first one that did it, wasn't it? I think they rented you for that time. It could well have been. I just know that. Uh, I just wanted to say that I noticed you didn't do the present building. And, and you know, I could have. I, I was up there recently, and I think it's a really interesting architectural phenomenon up there on the Acropolis. It's kind of cool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> One of the happy things about that was that they managed to, um, someone managed to keep them from having a lit sign. Mm -hmm. huh. Which would really have been bringing New York right into. Indeed. You know, and recently, you know, a bunch of state agencies have moved up there. You know, the, uh, some of the agencies that were displaced by the floods at the state office complex in Waterbury. Uh, and I think it's a really nice home for them. They've really done a nice they've job. They've been there for a long time. We, we expanded because we were making a lot of money, and, and then um, the the whole world collapsed and we had to rent it out and that's why half of the building is rented out. Do, do other people do stuff like this? I drive along, like, I drive, uh, anybody I'm with is driven nuts. I'm like, I whip out my camera from my glove compartment and I see something like this and I just, I have to stop and photograph it because sometimes I just think I'm losing my mind that like we actually do stuff like this. Yes, sir. Yeah, no, I, I absolutely agree and I think you sandwiched nicely with your first two examples <clears throat> and then this at the end where where particularly the people are trying to do historically correct visual functions but they they don't reflect at all the the structural nature of, of the arches or, or or awful facade stonework that we see all over the place and and, and, and that, that, that drives me crazy too. But I guess what, what I, I didn't see or hear in your discussion was the idea of form following function in terms of the interior function of the buildings. I mean, the, the, the round barn, as has already been said, was designed that way because it was efficient for the, for the activity that was going on there. The only two buildings that I, that I know really at all well that you talked about were was a Hunger Mountain co-op and the um, uh, the art building at, uh, at uh, Middlebury and personally I, I like the exteriors on them and that doesn't bother me but I find both buildings jarring and very hard to navigate and and and, and seem like like they don't make good use of, of, of space and it just doesn't seem like the the design and the use of that was integrated into a, into a you know a, 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 a process that that that, that, the, that the building was designed for the purpose of purposes. Of well, you know, it's very interesting about the interior of the Hunger Mountain Co-op. Until 1910, if you bought groceries anywhere in the country, 
it was like uh, going up to Mr. Drucker's store in Hooterville. You walked up to the counter and you told the person behind the counter what you wanted and he or she brought you your pound of sack of flour or, or you know whatever it was that you were buying. And then in 1910 in Memphis, Tennessee, this guy named Clarence Saunders invented the self-service supermarket. He called it Piggly Wiggly because he wanted to attract attention. And his idea was that instead of uh, having to get people to wait on you, uh, we could treat you like a rat in a maze. And so you walked through the front door, through a turnstile, and then you went on this predetermined path, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, very linear. And then you got to the uh, checkout counter at the end and you presented the groceries that you put in your cart and some clerk would sort of look at what you would put together and, you know, ring it up and charge you and you left. And that was the advent of the modern supermarket. Um, and so we've all been conditioned uh, to be those rats in a maze and we're very into that sort of linear up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down thing at the supermarket and then when uh, the uh, consultant at the Hunger Mountain Co-op hired to design their food, uh, their uh, retail space uh, got a hold of that store, they opted for something different that was more um, uh, circular, I guess you could say. And, uh, and I, you know, I, I know that there are lots of different opinions about that and I know that Hunger Mountain, when they re uh, expanded their store, kind of backtrack from that a little bit, but I, I, I think people have to overcome their conditioning a little bit. <laughs> I mean, the fact is that, you know, we're creatures of habit, right? And I don't know what grocery store you use, but at the ones I use, you know, I need to learn them. And before I learn them, no matter how the aisles are shaped, I, I'm lost until I know where the, you know, where the, um, where the olive oil is and where the, you know, where everything is in relation to everything else. I mean, I, I think that that's true of the art center too. Is is that there aren't discrete spaces for different things and stuff sort of flows out into the, into the halls and there's multiple levels and and stuff. And you call it dynamic or exciting or something like that. But but but, but certainly from someone who's who's used to a more traditional idea of discrete areas where different things happen. You know that that doesn't happen there at all, as far as I could tell. So maybe so maybe it's just me. But, but, you know, just too much a, too much the creature at habit. Yeah. There's always resistance to any change. There's a wonderful coffee table book called um, Treasures from the Vault. It's Frank Lloyd Wright, um, you know, designs that were never built. And one of them was for a bank in Oklahoma City, and it included a drive-in window, and it was rejected out of hand. They thought that was ridiculous. Yes, sir. Preface my, my question by saying I don't mean to pick on the co-op. Feel free. To pick on it up. Um, and I, I think it's a brilliant building, especially compared to Shaw's downtown. <laughs> so in comparison, I, I think you're right. It is a, a landmark in a sense. Um, but it concerns me a little bit that it's so close to the Winooski. And there's very little green space between the building and the river, and I guess in the post-Irene Vermont, um, where climate change is, I suppose, you know, a, a reality that I think everyone has maybe come to accept or is working on accepting. Um, I was wondering how you think architecture in this state and, and elsewhere will or needs to reflect that reality and, and that you know, if, if the co-op were to build that building again next year, do you think they, they may have re-evaluated kind of the, the site plan and, and moved away from the river? Just wondering what you think about that. Um, I, I think that, uh, first of all, th that building was cited before uh, the current level of awareness of climate chaos was with us, I mean, you know, it was, you know, clearly a brownfield of a lot so that it wasn't as if the uh, food co-op sort of took over a pristine riverside site and then exploited it, but would we build the same building there today? I mean, it is several feet above the, uh, above the Winooski River, and I don't know whether those buildings were as inundated as some of the other places in Montpelier have been that have experienced floods. I, um, I have to confess that my time in Montpelier, I also managed to miss the floods that have beset Montpelier from time to time. There have been a couple in my years of familiarity with the city, but I wasn't around for either of them. And 
So I'm equivocating. I mean, w would they build there again? Uh, maybe not. You were showing a two-story home with no windows, and uh, you were saying that they were choosing the design, but I personally feel like industry chooses the design of a lot of things, especially for people looking to build a home because there's certain materials out there and with a certain budget. So, I don't know, it just lends itself. The materials that are out there lend themselves to structures as such. Absolutely. And so I don't feel like necessarily the people have much of a choice. Um, you... Uh, I mean, they could have done something better than that, I agree, right. but I think that there's not a lot choice. It's just a Fair. statement. Fair statement. Yes, ma'am. I want you to go to Moscow mm -hmm. and look at Goom. Goom, I've been there. You've been there. Although it was back, uh, I visited Moscow, I, I visited Goom and I visited Moscow for the first time in 1991. When I arrived, the red flag was flying over the Kremlin. This is December of 1991. And when I let this when, when, I, when I left, it was gone. 73 years of Soviet communism. I showed up. Gone. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, I, I think it's alive today, but it's the most extraordinary piece of architecture. Mm -hmm. I just, just thought that you ought to be thinking about that. It is. Yeah. Oh, there's all sorts of uh, really cool things in Moscow. I'd love to come and give another lecture about Soviet constructivism. It's very. Uh, very cool stuff. And there was a great article in the Times yesterday, maybe, about Gordon Park, right. how that's been revitalized. Right. Moscow, I don't know. Thanks so much, Don. Thank you so much for having me.